Hello, I'm Vivian McGrath from beingunbeatable.com. If you're an Australian like I am, I'm sure you'll never forget the day that we all heard the name Rosie Batty. But if you don't know Rosie, she describes herself as having a celebrity status that nobody wants. In 2014, her ex murdered her only son whilst he was at cricket practice. It was a brutal and very public death. Luke was just 11 years old. Within hours, Rosie faced the media, and despite unimaginable grief, she spoke and the nation stopped and listened. This is what she said. No one loved Luke more than Craig, his father. No one loved Luke more than me. I believed he was safe. It was just a little cricket practice. His mum is being supported by friends until her family arrives from England. The family violence happens to everybody, no matter how nice your house is, how intelligent you are. It happens to anyone. In that moment, Rosie became a much needed face and voice of domestic violence. And in 2015, she was awarded the title Australian of the Year and hasn't stopped making a difference since. I'm sure you'll find Rosie's interview as moving as I do. How she ever forgave her ex is beyond me, but she did tell me why she's never going to let him win. Here's Rosie Batty. Rosie, it's just so lovely to have you here and it's, I'm a little bit nervous because you have inspired me so much and I'm also keenly aware that it's around the time of the fourth anniversary of your son's death and so I'd really like to start with Luke. Can you tell me about him? Um, I find it difficult to talk to him about him without crying and um, you're right, it's the anniversary of his death was on just a few days ago and um, it's it's wonderful how many people still remember and acknowledge Luke and it makes you realize just how much you're missing and it always so coincides in Australia here when schools are going back and you know that Luke isn't going back to school and what year would he be in and what would he be doing um, and I um, Luke was a delightful kid but he wasn't perfect um, and I, I just was so proud of him though because um, he you know he had a lot of my characteristics I think I think he he was courageous in his own way and he stood up for what he knew was right or wrong um, I didn't realize until he died his favorite color was yellow but then I noticed you know just before he died we bought yellow board shorts and he had yellow football boots and I thought why did I not pick that his favorite color was yellow but it was his friends at school that knew all of those things and they were able to share that with me um, so I have good memories to reflect on I don't think I'll ever forget that day after what happened to him you came out in front of the media and obviously broken but very calm and so articulate so articulate that you just stopped everyone me the whole nation in its tracks do you remember what you said on that day um, where though that came from wasn't contrived wasn't pre-planned I had no script I had no idea what was going to come out of my mouth and what was really clear as I stood outside of my beautiful home in a beautiful neighbourhood, no one knows what's going on behind that gate. It was such a powerful thing to say. How, but how did you find the strength to, to do that? You went on to not only um, deal with the most unfathomable grief, you became Australian of the, of the Year because somehow you found the strength mm -hmm. to keep on talking and keep on saying we cannot ignore this epidemic. Two women are killed every week. How on earth did you find the strength to do that? And look, this question has been asked of me a lot, so it's given me an opportunity to really think carefully about that. And I don't think there's one particular thing, but what I would say one of those things would be is um, I was six years old when I lost my mum. She died suddenly and 
all of a sudden myself and my two younger brothers were left alone. My dad was typical of his generation at that time. He didn't know how to tell you he loved you. He didn't know how to hold you. Um, he was a stoic, emotionless father who went out to work and my mum was looking after the children. And, you know, that was very typical of his generation and his parenting, which was very cold and sterile and non-emotional and non-affectionate. So um, when my mum died, um, I, I think as a little girl, you started to learn how, how to um, find a space for yourself to to, to, you know, to, to continue without your mum. And I can remember being very frightened. Um, I can remember people telling me to be a big girl and not cry. Um, and I had my grandmother, who was my mum's mum, and she lived till she was 100. Nanny Atkin. Nanny Atkin. And again, oh, the absolute matriarch of our family, we all adored her. And so her ordinariness, her down-to-earth humour and simple love of her family. Um, you know, I have no doubt that she played a huge part. It's really interesting what you say because there's, it, there's also a double-edged sword to this because although that gave you the strength to just push through grief and keep putting one foot in front of the other instead of going into a dark hole, which most of us would have. I also always talk a lot about the fact that abusive relationships or going into dysfunctional relationships never happens in isolation. It's a generational thing. It's a cycle that passes down from generation to the generation. And it's as subtle as your father's emotional needs weren't met. So when, when your mother dies, he said, don't cry, be strong, suppress your emotions, ignore them. You go to a Catholic school, your headmistress says, you're not wanted here. Talk about abandonment issues and feeling like you're not good enough and unwanted. In what way do you think that then informed you and the relationships, and your relationship with Greg, if you like? I think, um, and you're absolutely right, Viv, that um, you, know, you have to look and say, well, it's no coincidence that you find yourself in an unhealthy, unfulfilling, toxic or unhealth, un un you know, relationships. Um, so what, what, how, what did bring you to, to these, this place? And um, my abandonment issues absolutely stem from the loss of my mum in a very sudden way. And I've spent a lifetime actually understanding the trauma and attachment issues I have. And uh, not a lot was known about that up until fairly recently, actually, when we start to hear the word trauma a lot more. But people actually don't really understand how it manifests and, and how, how it's affecting people. So I think that it is about putting one step in front of the other in the best way that you possibly can. But I do remember somebody who'd suffered a significant, you know, hideous injuries and nearly died and miraculously she lived and she was someone that was affected by the, the um, bombings in London. Jill Hicks. Gillian Hicks. Yes. And she said to me, she was so determined to push forward through her hideous injuries where she lost both legs and, and, and I don't know what other injuries she, she experienced, but certainly the loss of her legs. She was very, very close to dying as well. Yeah. And I, when you hear her story, um, and then she, she shared with me that she pushed through, she was determined to be positive and she went through her recovery, all of this. And it took seven years for her to collapse mm. into a, a, you know, perhaps at a, part, a, 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 at a time when I believe she was ready to... And it was safe it. enough to... And I've always thought that because when people, when this first happened, 
and I was preparing for Luke's coronal inquiry and media wanting to speak to me, I was working with really well with some lovely people and they would continually say, are you okay to say? And I said, will you stop mm. checking in with me? Because every time you do that, it reminds me there's something wrong with me. So I had to kind of coach people on how to treat me because when you've had something like this happen, the, the sense of horror and dread in people's eyes, and you will hear people say that they, you know, people disappear out of your life, people avoid you on the street. People, they can't deal with grief, your grief. They don't know, they know what to, to say. It. They don't know what to say. They're full of just, and, and it's so uncomfortable for them for all the reasons that not everybody can handle it. Not everyone can remain there. And so for me, I didn't fall into that heap um, that people would say is typical of what we would expect. And when we look at other people who hasn't fall, haven't, didn't fall in a heap, um, we would say Lindy Chamberlain. And we victim blamed her. We actually put her in prison. And there would still be some people in Australia who would say, well, I didn't like the way that she, she didn't cry. Her face was stony. Um, and because of the way she didn't conform to what we would expect a grieving mother to behave like, we actually persecuted in her a way that is actually unforgivable. For people who aren't in Australia, that, uh, Lindy uh, Chamberlain was the woman whose uh, baby was taken by a dingo. So that story really kind of resonated with me and I do remember at the time of Luke's murder, the homicide chief, head of homicide working with me said, this is a premeditated act. You are not to blame. And those words, absolutely, I clung to. But I'm so grateful because I did deeply understand that no one is to blame. Everyone went to work doing the best job that they knew how. The one person to blame was Greg, who chose to murder Luke as an act of power and control and revenge to make me suffer for the rest of my life. And so I am kind of compelled to say, you have altered my life. The pain will never go away, but I can't let him ruin it, because then he's won. So there's that element of determination that no matter what, I can't let him win. And I know that I am damaged through this. And I wasn't just damaged the night that Luke was murdered in front of me. I, was, I had a 12 year journey of violence with Greg and I never married him. I never lived with him. It was through my pregnancy that I started to understand his violent and controlling behaviors were unacceptable and something that would never bring me happiness. Um, and so it's been 12, it was 12 years prior to Luke being murdered while I was juggling this abusive man who was determined to disrupt my life in the most effective ways possible. And the year before Luke died, it was an, a very intense journey of in, being in and out of the court system. And, you know, and during that time, friends and family did not know what to say, did not know what to support me. A lot of their comments were not intended to hurt or be unhelpful, but they were. And a lot of it is all around victim blaming. It is a lot around what I should be doing. And there was always the inference, I should be doing more. As you said, you did everything right. You took all the right steps. You got the pieces of paper. And that was never going to protect you. No. And... You know, that is from the child protection responses, from the police, from the magistrates, from your friends. Everybody thinks, oh, you, you know, you have to get an intervention order. And nobody realises Well, he flouted the, every single part of that system. And But whilst you're being put in this position where everybody's saying this is what you have to do, no one actually understands the level of fear that you have, because by taking that step, you're taking the power and the control, Away from and him. you're raising the bar, and you have no idea what that is going to 
um, initiate, you know. Well, you thought he was going to kill you, didn't you? You wrote a will and... As Luke approached the age I was when my mum died, I was very conscious of my vulnerability and what would happen to Luke if, if I died, in, you know, if something happened to me. And I think to cope a lot of, with a lot of violence, you minimise what's happening because that's the only way you can stay sane. But I, I honestly could never comprehend that Greg would seriously hurt me, never mind kill me. Um, I don't think I would assume anyone I knew would be capable of that because, you see, you hear of things on the radio or on the TV and they happen to other people. They happen to other people, not people you know, and certainly not yourself or your family. So I think that, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to convey was if it can happen to me, a strong, independent woman who is no shrinking violet, more than capable of holding my own and standing up for what I know is wrong, if this can happen to me, it absolutely can happen to any other woman. That You know, I had to be counselled. Mm before Luke was killed, I went to counselling. I didn't honestly realise I was experiencing violence. You went through 12 years of abuse yeah. and you, like many women, even myself, weren't even aware at the beginning that it was abuse. I think it's, um, that's the subtleness of, subtle, subtlety of it all, isn't it? You meet somebody you're highly attracted to, um, there is a chemistry, there is a uh, an anticipation in the honeymoon stage um, that, you know, you find somebody and, I, and again, for me, there was a, a deep attraction, a challenge. Those little characteristics of arrogance or um, something you couldn't quite put your finger on, but you thought you could excuse or... Um, and they explain it away as well. When you're in a relationship, I guess that the thing is that those subtle things don't occur overnight, but I think there's always, at a particular time on reflection, when you look back and you would go, that was the time I should have got out of the relationship. Those red flags, those warning signs that we... The first time ignore, yeah. I felt frightened when he got angry and shouted at me. And then I tried to rationalise that behaviour and say, and say, well, he didn't really mean it. Um, I can see how why he would have been upset, and um, um, you know, and and you think it may not happen again, and then you alter your behaviour to try and you know accommodate, and maybe some of us are more predisposed to take on more blame, um, and and feel it's their fault in some way, um, and so I think that you know one of the things I, I learned was. Violence will always continue to escalate mm, yeah. as you become more and more desensitised. There's nothing left, but it continues to get worse. And it would be incredibly rare for anybody to experience one form of violence. It, there would be many different forms. You know, the intimacy in the bedroom. How much is it as a mutually satisfying experience and how much is it about power and control? and degrading you or having power over you. Mm. Um, and, you know, I look back at lots of those things and I never have talked about that intimacy. Mm. But I, that was not a normal, nurturing, loving, intimate environment for me with Greg. Mm. And so I think a lot of these things are really difficult to come to terms with and rationalise. And those most intimate parts are very difficult to talk about with certainly even your closest of friends. Mm. You know, I look back and on a particular incident when... Greg frightened me greatly and I immediately after he'd gone rang a counselling service and went to see them and I started intensive counselling for a period of time and it was through that that I, he, he said, you know, is Greg being violent? And I said, well, I don't know. And they, they, you know, they had me information and I read these, this flyer and I went, oh my gosh, all of what I'm experiencing is violence. Because Even though he doesn't hit you. Yeah. Because it wasn't physical. Yeah, that's right. I didn't realise it was violence. 
So he had never hit me. He'd certainly manhandled me. He'd pulled my hair. So he had physically assaulted me, really. But again, he hadn't put bruised me, broken bones. I hadn't gone to hospital. So I didn't think the violence... Well, so I didn't think it was violence. I didn't think it was violence enough to bother the police. And I certainly didn't understand how dangerous psychological violence and stalking behaviours are. That's the most crucial thing, I think, because, you know, in the UK now, it's coercive control, emotional abuse, is deemed a crime. And your case is really interesting, and I keep saying this to a lot of people who write to me, that, as you say, it does escalate, and emotional violence will escalate, and very often it's a precursor to physical violence. You didn't have extreme physical violence, yet you went from emotional violence to your son being murdered by him. I think. So, what would you say to women who are not even sure they're in emotional abuse? Well, I think one of the things that's really difficult is um, your systemic responses. Um, the police, the court systems um, have varying degrees of understanding about the different forms of violence. It's very difficult to prove. Um, anything that's not physical violence. And so um, there, there is still an awful lot of misunderstanding. And, and certainly violence through the court system at this point is treated in isolated events. And we know that family violence is cumulative. When we look at choking, um, that is an absolute indicator that you will be killed. No ways about it. If I read that the, if you've been strangled, the odds of you being killed by that person go up 750%, yeah. which shocked me because that's what happened to well, me. Well, when you consider that either they've chosen not to extinguish your last breath or they've been interrupted or that you've survived regardless, but another opportunity is is it's you know you're not going to get another opportunity to be so lucky um stalking behaviors are incredibly dangerous mm. um psychological abuse where it's constantly you know um, having that coercive control and things like that over you but there is still so much for um people who have no expertise in this to actually really understand so those red flags are really danger signs um, and I think that um, it is very difficult to get the support that you need to have that, to be able to understand that. And this is why I always say you must connect into a specialised family violence organisation. If you see any of those signs in your relationship, absolutely. Because your family, your friends may downplay the violence, they may not be helpful, they might try to give you advice. If you don't leave, they may just lose patience with you and think, oh my gosh. So it's very difficult to get the emotional support or the practical support that you need um, without judgment, without blame. And I know when I had incidences where I just felt I couldn't ring my friends anymore, I would, I had rang a crisis support line and the validation they gave me and the deep understanding and the way that they listened really did help me. And so, you, you know, ultimately what needs to happen is the perpetrator is made accountable for his violence. So we need to have intervention and we're still a long way from that. So what is happening in this man's life? Why? Is he choosing to be violent? And what can we do, not just to protect me, but to stop his choice of violence? I want to. I want to go. Th I want to pick that up later about um, stopping them and how we can um, address and intervene. Yeah. But first, I want to go back and just pick up on where you uh, we left off earlier in that when you went into the Victorian Parliament, you said something so incredible that I think only somebody who's been in that sort of relationship can understand. And you said, Greg was able to murder someone he loved more than anyone. Can you elaborate that and explain that? Because I think a lot of people would not understand that. I think it's incredibly difficult to understand, isn't it? Because in our logical thinking brain, 
how could we ever believe that somebody who loves his son, who's never raised a hand... And you said was a good father. When I say a good father, I have, you know, my, learn, my journey of learning as well. Um, since Luke's death, I can, you know, um, challenge myself on that too. But Greg adored Luke, would, um, even though he wasn't earning money and even though he had little, he would go hungry so he could afford a train fare to come and visit Luke um, or pay for him to um, see a naturopath or any of those things. So he would never abuse Luke. His, his violence was towards me. And, but he used that violence and his intimidation and his control in front of Luke. And you were saying earlier that it's about power and control. It's about power and control. So Luke and I learnt from the very beginning how to, I guess, adjust our behaviours uh, around Greg or because of Greg and things like that, which puts an awful lot of strain, which has become normalised. And so I would challenge myself now and say, you can't be a good father if you are using violence to your partner. I'm not sure why a person who um, probably feels that they love you is driven to assert so much misery um, and the need for power and control over what you're doing. But ultimately, when you have taken a stand and realised that this relationship is unhealthy um, and you have you have ended the relationship and defined boundaries and the bound you know for, for me I was a friendly parent making it easy and accessible for, for him to be a partner a father to Luke so the power and control was always able to be played out through Luke changing access visits shifting the goalposts, shifting the goalposts always knowing the reaction he would get, I would get, I would give him. But when they tired, when he no longer got those reactions, which is exactly what happened the year before, I stopped. I focused on my own self-worth, I guess. Um, I made the decision that I wouldn't tolerate any more violent behaviour from him. I did what everyone had been telling me to do for years. I took out the intervention order. I reported all breaches of the intervention order. I put down firm boundaries and I thought it was working and I thought, gosh, I should have done this a long time ago. But I hadn't realised, you know, what I have learned since, that by taking that power and control, it makes them feel more inadequate because it comes from a place of inadequacy actually mm, inside them. Absolutely, it? it has to. And I think, you know, where can I assert more control? So then it becomes a surging control and power using the court system. So I think with, um, you know, people don't even really understand that, and I didn't comprehend that he could use the court system as another avenue of abuse where he could control, he didn't turn up but I did, um, and all of these, and then he turned up when it suited him just to confuse everything. So it was really, really difficult. But I think, you know, when I look at my character, I'm very generous, I'm very kind and compassionate, I'm very forgiving. I'm predisposed to be those things, either because that's how I am, my family are, we're trusting, we wouldn't believe the worst of anybody. So, you, you know, that's, Yes, so these people are attracted to you because of all these qualities. Yeah, they um, are actually qualities and, and it's in a sense we have so much empathy, we want to rescue yes, and look after yes. them and save them and they need someone to take the blame and take more of the responsibility for the relationship. So in a sense, we are strong as victims, we're not weak, they're, they're sucking our strength. Absolutely, and I've, I've, you know, I say a lot of the time, because you're a victim of family violence, never think as a victim they're weak because managing the violence, having to survive it, having to live with it, it takes incredible strength. And, um, you know, and to leave a relationship is, is you know, again, 
the strength that you need with the uncertainty of what's ahead, you know, and... Um, and the added fear, your self-esteem has been assaulted every day. And, and also that, you know, what is this myth around leaving that some miracle, by some miracle it actually ends? Because for many of us, particularly all children who are involved, the violence just continues. Um, and, you know, it can be putting you into poverty, withdrawing child support. Um, it can be sabotaging your reputation where people think ill of you rather than of them and they love can be, playing the victim don't they well they they'll do what they can to continue to make your life miserable so they can even you know bring in a new partner who who also adds to that abuse you know it's, trauma is very difficult post-traumatic stress mm. um anxiety depression you know, these are real. It's very real. And the fear of the, your future, the fear of the unknown. Yeah. Was there an element of, because I hear this a lot as well, even when the danger level increases, of I feel sorry for him? Yeah, I definitely felt sorry for him. Um, I felt sorry for him. He couldn't keep a job. Um, all of these things. Um, and that makes you want to nurture them. No, I, I didn't want to nurture him, actually. I just wanted to be mindful of what I thought was um, very difficult for him. But that doesn't mean that in previous relationships I hadn't tried. I had a five-year relationship with someone who was a chronic alcoholic mm. just before mm. Greg. Um, and, you know, I desperately tried to help him stop drinking and mm. got sucked into that vortex of living with an alcoholic and not mm. being able to save them and learned that you can't save people. So yeah, I find it very confusing to work out, did Greg really ever love me? And it doesn't really matter anymore because that isn't love. That isn't love. Um, love isn't um, making somebody um, restricting somebody or controlling somebody or being able to um, f make them feel less of themselves because it makes you feel better. You know, the, that, that's all behaviour that is, is, is not a healthy relationship. And, and, you know, we can kind of talk ourselves into staying, making it better than it really is, but it will never give us the inner peace enjoy that other relationships give other people that we see you know and I can I pick those relationships and I think wow you know I've never had a relationship like that how can that be in my whole lifetime I'm 56 um, you know so what is it about myself that I have to really look at and, I and nurture key. you were saying that before that and I wanted to pick up on that too which is it really is key it's not about rescuing changing them you said the turning point for you is when you started to build your self-esteem. And that's what I always say. I call it start with me and take your focus off them. And it, it started... In so that connects to boundaries. Yeah, it started in earnest for me when I first moved to my, the property where I live now. And it's a lovely home. And I was able to do that because my father sold his farm and I was given some money that I um, put into this property and... Um, Greg made it very difficult for me when I moved because I think out of jealousy and perhaps an intention of him wanting to be part of that and I clearly wasn't going to change. And um, so his violence was really intensified and so I actually reached out to a crisis support line and they told me that they were having a, um, a group meeting in um, a place called Rosebud which is about half an hour away for women like myself. So I chose to go, and I actually went to every single one for a period of a couple of months. Um, it was really confronting going into a room where all these women were, and now we were all there for the same reason. I'd never seen, I didn't even know of anybody else actually other than myself experiencing violence. And, you know, some women never spoke for the whole time, and others did, but there was this beyond words, the understanding between us was, was so healing and powerful, and, um, and it, it helped change me. Um, and as I focused on myself and made new friends because of that and really loved what I, that those changes, 
the violence and what I was experiencing with Greg became less as I started to build myself more. And, you know, so this is years before Luke was killed, but it was a journey. And so, you know, the journey isn't an overnight thing. It's a gradually and moving forward, um, prioritising yourself. It's putting your needs first. Putting your needs first. Re-establishing, you know, that inner passion of, of yourself, the things that you, you know, have always wanted to do or wanted to be. And you go, well, it's time to, you know, start to focus on those things. Um, and, um, you know, and so that, that was the journey, you know, and, and I still do that now, I guess, because um, there's still more for me to do, you know, um, to learn, to keep growing. You know, I think it's really important to... I'm revisiting my spirituality. Um, I've kind of parked that for a while, but I think it's really important to to constantly reevaluate, constantly look at getting insight, wisdom, and and growing. And um, you know, when you're in that chaos and in the midst of all of that, it's very hard to thrive. You're just surviving. You're surviving, yeah. And it's. Do you think there's a connection between the fact that you were at your strongest and highest in self-esteem and, in fact, Luke was starting to it's grow a up and pull away from it's, it's, a, it's a complete connection. I mean, it's absolutely it. You know, I had, I had, he had no more power over me. I was no longer buying into and reacting to his controlling behaviours that he'd exerted over me for 12 years. Also, Luke was on the cusp and had already started growing up. He was seeking to be with his friends. He, he, you know, he was already pulling away from me as his mum, it wasn't cool. And he certainly had arrived at exactly the point where he didn't want to see his dad. Why do you think Greg did what he did at that point? So basically he'd lost complete control over me and Luke. He, he could say I had won. And he had lost hope in his life because after a journey of mental health issues, um, constantly falling in and out of employment, homelessness, he had been ejected the week before out of where he was living. He couldn't go and live, move, he couldn't go back and live in his car because they'd repossessed it. He was back in a boarding house amongst other damaged people. Um, at another low point in his life and I think he'd been considering it for some time. He had mentioned a knife on several occasions, all known to the police, all known to authorities. Um, but those, you know, we don't look at them as cumulative, um, in a cumulative way. It's kind of like, well, is he at risk to himself? No. Well, yes, all of this kind of um, isolated, in, these insolences aren't in isolation. And it was my forensic psychologist said to me, be very, very cautious of this man. He has mentioned a knife on several occasions. He hasn't threatened to kill me with it. He has mentioned it on several occasions. But why didn't he just kill himself? Why well, I, we, we said from the beginning, this is an act of power, control and revenge the ultimate act to make me suffer for the rest of my life. That is it. That is it. How could to hurt me more than anything else? If he'd have just killed himself, it would have given me peace. Yes. And he said to me when I went to the police 18 months before, you may think you'll outlive me in this lifetime, but I can make you suffer. So you go to the police with that threat and it goes into the system. He never got to court. You know, you spend a year in and out of court because he never turns up, so all of these things. So it's absolutely an act of power, control and revenge. He'd lost all control over me. You know, there are many instances where men um, don't just commit suicide, they take out their whole family. And there's many of that, that, those that have happened over, you know, recent years alone in Australia. Ultimately, um, yeah, when suicidal ideation is a factor, you or your children or both are in significant danger. Um, these are the red flags that if we had a systemic response that worked on preventing fatalities rather than reacting to a fatality, 
um, you know, would have would would have been a different outcome for Luke and I. But um, you know, that's that's the whole thing about getting people to be aware. Another thing about you know that that day that you came out and said what you said the morning after that awful day. What was also incredible was you said nobody loved Luke more than Greg. Mm. And from that day on, you've never said a bad word about him. You've got every right to be angry. How on earth have you been able to forgive? Um, I've always had a forgiving nature. Whether that is good or not, I would, I'd like to think it is. Because I think if you choose not to forgive but to hold on to the anger and the pain, it limits you. It begins to define you and it, it it's away at you. And by forgiving doesn't mean that you condone what they've done. It just means you release what they've done as you move forward in the best way you can. That's, that's how I feel. So my grief is consumed with Luke. There is no space to give Greg any more thought. I feel very sorry for his family who loved him dearly. And on occasion I think, Greg, what did you do? You know, what did you do? Greg was a little boy once. He didn't grow up realising that in his 50s he would murder his son and exit this world in such a dramatic, horrible way. So I choose to embrace my memory of Luke and make sure that no matter what, I will continue to be the best person I can be and not let him define and limit me and consume me. The saddest thing about it is, ever since I've been writing and all that, the, how I've realised the extent and the depth. There's not just Rosie Batty, there's millions of Rosie Batties. How do we stop this epidemic? It's really overwhelming to realise how many people are really affected in such a debilitating, horrible way. Um, and how, it, you know, how we change it is, is, is acknowledging its prevalence. You know, in Australia, we have one in three women, and I always talk about the statistics, we have one in three women who will be physically assaulted and living and, and, and physical, experience physical violence. Um, we have one in four children, and we have one woman a week being murdered. Um, so we need to really start conversations. We need to be calling out the violence as we see it. We can't condone it. We can't turn a blind eye to it. As men, we need um, the men in this world to be stepping up because not all men are violent. But a man's voice calling out another man is incredibly powerful. So ultimately, it's about us as a society um, no longer being complicit and accepting about violence in you know, family violence. That will go an awful long way. So this is a long-term change that we are changing. Um, you can expect that this is a long journey towards change, but the change is definitely happening. Um, well, no least because of you standing up, changing the conversation, and so we all owe you a debt of gratitude to that. I know Luke would be incredibly proud, I'm sure. I don't know him, but hearing how beautiful he was and how sensitive he was, he would be so proud. And I was so inspired by you that you, that I decided to finally tell my story and add my voice to yours. So I just can't thank you enough, Rosie. And I just, I know how hard it must be for you to keep going, but you do, and we're all grateful for that. I just wanted to finish on, you, in your book, you wrote a letter to the me that never was. Yes, I did. And it's been a long time since that. Mm. If you were to write that letter to the me that never was now, what would you say differently? Oh, Viv, I, I don't know. I don't know at this point in time. Um, you know, you, you look at the choices that you make and you think, well, you can't, 
regret them because regret is a wa you know wasteful time. Um, you know, it's, it, so they make you know the decisions you make and the experiences you have make you who you are. But gee, I would do anything to have not to be going through this. Um, and yeah, the, the me that never was. I can't regret anything I did because I wouldn't have had a look. But um, how I could rewrite that, um, maybe I'll give it some thought um, in, the, in some time. Because, you know, you, you do look at that little girl who've just... And we're all still up the little girls from, you know, we never... We are always still that vulnerable little girl, um, no matter how old we ever become and whatever happens to us, aren't we? And I that, agree, totally. That innocence of who we are and who we thought we would be. Um, and, you know, it just been apparent to me recently, I've just been on a, a retreat where I do need to revisit that little girl again. And, and do nurture so. that little girl and love that little girl and give her the self-esteem she never had. I think that's crucial to healing and not passing it down the actually breaking the cycle and I think that um, you know certainly for me I, I feel so lucky honored privileged to receive such support um, I can't imagine what my life would be like without all these people um, who come to me on a daily basis letting me know how much how highly they regard me and what a difference I've made in, in so many lives. And I realise that, you know, that's what I set out to do is make sure that Luke didn't die in vain. And so I feel incredibly honoured that um, I'm able to enjoy a journey that um, so many other victims of violence will, will never have. Well, there's absolutely no chance that Luke died in vain and he will never be forgotten by the incredible legacy that you have created and just by the fact that you are honouring him in continuing to serve others, help others and wow, I mean what a difference you've made. There definitely was before Rosie Batty and a conversation about family violence after Rosie Batty so we're so grateful to you and I just thank you so much because I know how busy your schedule is and I'm just such in awe of you and so honoured that you gave me so much of your time. Thank, thank you, Viv. Thank you very much.